We have a number of visitors among us, and we're so happy that you can be here to worship God today. Uh, some may be here for the first time. We're especially thankful for you and want you to stay around after services and get to know us. If you have questions about what we do in our worship, feel free to ask uh, anyone after services, and we'll be glad to talk with you about those things. I want to make mention that tonight after services, uh, from about 6.15 to 6.45 or so, uh, those who've been meeting for the home Bible study class will conclude that series uh, back in the room in the back. Um, and if you've been in, in that class, I encourage you to be there tonight as we wind up our study of the home Bible study material. In 1 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 5, and in 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 5, the Apostle Paul commends Timothy to faith unfeigned, as the King James Version has it. 1 Timothy 1 and verse 5 says, Now the end of the commandment is charity out of a pure heart, and of a good conscience, and of faith unfeigned. The New King James Version there says, Sincere faith. In 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 5, again, Paul writing to his young friend Timothy. He says, When I call to remembrance the unfeigned faith that is in thee, which dwelt also first in thy grandmother Lois and thy mother Eunice, and I am persuaded that in thee also. The New King James Version there, instead of saying unfeigned faith, says genuine faith. When we talk about something being unfeigned, it means it's genuine, it's real, it's sincere, it's not faked. Our faith needs to be unfeigned. It needs to be genuine, sincere, not fake. When we were living in Gadsden, Alabama in the early 1980s, uh, there was an elderly sister in the congregation there that passed away. And she had a good bit of furniture in her estate. We didn't have any furniture in our estate <laughs> at the time. And uh, as a result of that, her children decided to give us, I think, a washing machine and also a china cabinet, a hutch, sometimes they're called, that for, for years was by far the, the nicest looking piece of furniture that we had. You know, we, we still have it. It's, it's sitting in our dining room now. And a lot of times when people would walk into our house, of course, they, they could look at our old ratty couch and our tables that, you know, were looked like they didn't look, you know, much. And and they'd try to find something to compliment, and there really wasn't anything there. So they'd look at this hutch, and they'd say, oh, well, that's beautiful. You know, what a, that's, that's really nice. That's, that's carved so... And if you look at it, it looks like, especially if you stand back a little bit, that somebody has just spent a, a lot of time with the woodwork in there, and it's just carved so beautifully. It has all of this ornate stuff on it, you know. The thing is made out of plastic. <laughs> it's, it's fake from... I don't... I'm not sure if there's any wood in it. It is, it is, it is plastic, all that beautiful stuff. And you, you can't really tell, even if you get really close, you have to tap on it. When you tap on it, you say, you know what, that's plastic. A lot of Christians are like that. They look just right on the outside, and even maybe if you look pretty close, it's just exactly what a Christian should be. But it's plastic. It's feigned. It's not real. I want to talk with you this morning about faith that is unfeigned, faith that is real. The psalmist says in Psalm 81 and verse 15 that the haters of the Lord would pretend submission to Him. We're not pretending as Christians. We're not playing like we believe in God. We're not playing like we're obedient to God. We really must be. And so that brings us really to the first point that unfeigned faith is faith that is lived by. If you believe it, you live it. In Romans chapter 1 and verse 17, as Paul talks about the gospel of Jesus Christ, he says, In it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, The just shall live by faith. My understanding of Paul's meaning in this passage is this, that the gospel, which we have in the New Testament, is God's revealed faith. It is the faith. And in, in, in this gospel is revealed the faith by which our faith lives. We live by the faith that is in the gospel. From faith to faith, I believe is the import of what he's saying. 
And so the just shall live by faith. A lot of us have Facebook. You have a Facebook? I know some people despise Facebook. Some people don't know what it is. But when you sign up for Facebook, they ask you if you want to tell a little bit about yourself so people that visit your little page can, can tell it and, and can, can know a little bit about you. And, and, you know, there's this place where religious views or something. And I know a lot of you put things like a Church of Christ or this or that. I thought about that a long time. That's weird. That's the, one, that's the question I got stuck on when I was signing up for my Facebook. I, what should I, what should I, what are my religious views? What do I really believe? What, what do I really want to say here? I finally just decided I was, I, what I put was whatever the Bible says. Whatever the Bible, that's what I believe. That's what I'm trying to live by. That explains my religious views as much as anything I can think of. Whatever the Bible says. Faith that is unfeigned is faith that lives whatever the Bible says. In Galatians chapter 2 and verse 20, the Apostle Paul says, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I that live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live, I live in faith. That faith which is in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. That's a life of true faith. In Hebrews chapter 10, if you look there with me in your Bibles this morning, Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 38 the Apostle, whoever the Hebrew writer is, quoting here the same passage that the Apostle Paul referenced in Romans 1.17 that we read a little earlier. He says, just shall live by faith. And if anyone draws back, my soul has no pleasure in him. But we are not of those who draw back to perdition, but of those who believe to the saving of the soul. The just shall live by faith. Well, how do we live by faith? What what does that really mean in practical terms to live by faith? The writer of the book of Hebrews is at pains to explain that to us in the following chapter. We know this great chapter, Hebrews 11, the chapter on faith that has all of these these, uh, heroes of faith in it. That's where we go to understand how to live by faith, really. This is somewhat of an unfortunate chapter break. Because at the end of chapter 10, these two verses that we just read, it segues right into what is said in chapter 11 and verse 1. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. By it the elders obtained a good testimony. Look at verse 3. By faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God so that the things which are seen were not made of the things which are visible. What do you believe about the creation of the world? Do you believe that uh, we've all come from goo through the monkey of the zoo to you? Or do you believe what Genesis 1 says? What the writer says here is, by faith we understand that the worlds were made out of things that aren't visible. Because faith sees that. You can understand that. That's what we believe. That's what we hold to. Look at verse 7 of Hebrews 11. By faith, Noah, being divinely warned of things not yet seen, moved with godly fear, prepared an ark for the saving of his household. Noah hadn't seen a worldwide flood before, may not have seen rain before. But he, God tells him, there's going to be a flood. Build the ark. And Noah moves. He lives. As if that thing which he has not seen, but which God told him about, is absolutely real. Builds the ark. That's living by faith. Living by faith You come down to verse 8 and look at Abraham. By faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to a place which he would receive as an inheritance, and he went out not knowing where he's going. God tells him, if you go back in the Old Testament, God tells him, go to a land that I will show you. You haven't seen it. 
You haven't been there. You don't even know where it is. But Abraham lives by faith. Whatever God's Word says, that's what he lives. There's a little three-year-old boy named Todd I read about. A boy from Rhode Island. One day, his dad wanted to take him down to the seashore and fly a kite. Todd had never seen a kite fly before. Of course, he'd seen airplanes fly and birds fly and lots of things fly, but he'd never seen a kite fly. And so they get the kite, and they head down to the seashore, and Todd had some doubts about whether this thing's going to fly. Doesn't have a motor, doesn't have, have wings. His father assures him, no, this kite's going to fly. So they go down to the shore, and Todd helps his dad get it all ready. He unravels the string and stretches it out. And before you know it, the kite goes up. And Todd says, I knew it would fly, Daddy, because you said it would. What God says, that's what we live by. That's what we trust in. That's what we believe. Faith trusts God's word when it comes to many things that we can't see. But we believe in the forgiveness of sins through the blood of Jesus Christ because that's what God, God's Word says. We believe in how to live as a better husband or a better wife because God's Word tells us what to do. God's Word tells us about things like the importance of giving with liberality and a thousand other things that we could mention. It tells us of an eternal home called heaven. That like Abraham, we've not seen where we're going. But we trust that it's there, and we live by faith on the journey. Faith that is genuine, that is unfeigned, is faith that is lived by. Faith that is genuine and is unfeigned is faith that prays. Prayer, you know, implies confidence in the existence and the power and the goodness of God. If you don't believe that God exists, you're likely not going to try to talk to Him. If you don't believe that He's powerful and that he can do anything for you, you're probably not going to talk to him. And if you don't believe that he's good and wants to help you, you're probably not going to talk to him. So prayer demands faith in the existence, the power, and the goodness of God. A great barometer, measurement of your faith, is your prayer life. People that say, well, I just can't find time to pray, or when you think about it in yourself, you just realize you're, you don't hardly pray at all. What it says to you is that your faith is not strong, and it may just be fake. Because if you really believe that there's a God, if you really believe that He was all-powerful and all-good, you'd be wanting to talk to Him all the time. The psalmist in Psalm 4 and verse 3 assures us, Know that the Lord has set apart for himself he who is godly, and the Lord will hear when I call to him. Do you remember the story that Jesus told in Luke chapter 18? The uh, persistent widow, we call it. There's this widow that she's got a legal problem. She needs a, uh, to be avenged of her adversary, so to speak. And she goes to this judge, and the judge really doesn't care much about anything or anybody. He doesn't regard man. He doesn't have a lot of respect for the law, apparently, hardly anything. But the woman keeps on going to him, persisting in her appeal to get justice, to be avenged. And finally, the judge gives in because of her persistence. And the Lord said in... Luke 18 and verse 6. Hear what the unjust judge said. And shall God not avenge his own elect to cry out day and night to him, though he bears long with them? 
I tell you that he will avenge them speedily. What Jesus is saying here is that if we are persistent and faithful, surely if an unjust judge would grant a request because somebody was persistent, our God who is just and holy and good will grant our requests. But then Jesus adds a, a, a rather puzzling statement when you first see it to the end of this. And the statement is this, at the end of verse 8, he says, Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, will he really find faith on the earth? Now what he's been talking about is persistence in prayer. He's talking about keeping on, keeping on when you pray, not giving up in prayer. And then he adds, when I come back, when the Son of Man comes back, will he find faith? What does he mean? Will he find people praying? Because if there's no praying, it means there's no faith. Faith that is real is a faith that prays. Faith that is real is a faith that speaks God's Word. You believe it, it means something to you. You'll talk about it. 2 Corinthians 4.13 Since we have the same spirit of faith, according to what is written, I have believed, and therefore I spoke, we also believe, and therefore speak. If your faith is real, you'll talk about it, like anything else that is real to you, that is important to you. And it doesn't matter how small your voice, you'll talk about it anyway. And that small voice can make all the difference. Some of you may have seen the 2008 movie called um, Horton Hears a Who. You seen that? It's a classic. It's based on the 1954 Dr. Seuss book by the same name. I think there was also a TV uh, cartoon that was by the same name. The story is about an elephant with a big ears named Horton, who is able to hear people who are living on the top of a clover, little teeny tiny people living on the top of a clover. And Horton can hear them, but nobody else can hear them. And in the story, there is a, a kangaroo that thinks Horton is crazy and wants to destroy the clover. And of course, Horton is trying to save the clover because of all of the little people that he knows are on it that he can hear. And so he tries to get the people, little tiny people in Whoville on the clover to make all of the noise they can so that others can hear them as well. And as the story goes, all of the little Who's in Whoville are chirping and shouting and yapping at the top of their lungs and still nobody but Horton can hear. And the mayor of Whoville is trying to figure out what the problem is. And just as he felt he was getting nowhere and almost about to give up in despair, he suddenly burst through a door, and that mayor discovered one shirker quite hidden away in the Fairfax Apartments, apartment 12J. A very small, very small shirker named Jojo was standing, just standing, and bouncing a yo-yo not making a sound, not a yip, not a chirp. And the mayor rushed inside and grabbed the young twerp, and he climbed with the lad up the Ethelberg Tower. This, cried the mayor, is your town's darkest hour, the time for all who's who have blood that is red to come to the aid of their country, he said. We've got to make noise in greater amounts, so open your mouth for every voice counts. Thus he spoke as he climbed, and when he got to the top, the lad cleared his throat and shouted out, Yop! And that yop, that one small extra yop, put it over. Finally at last, from the speck on that clover, their voices were heard. They rang out clear and clean. And the elephant smiled. Do you see what I mean?
your little voice, the little voice of one believer, can make all the difference. Faith unfeigned makes that joyful sound, sound of the gospel. It was the voice of a young child who believed in Jesus, pleading with my grandfather, please come with us to church. That changed his life. And I'm forever thankful to my older sister Patty for being that one small voice that put it over the top. Faith speaks God's word. Faith grows stronger through its trials, and there will be trials, lots of them. In Acts 14 and verse 21, when they preached the gospel to that city, Luke records, and made many disciples, they returned to Lystra, Iconium, and Antioch, they being Paul and Barnabas, strengthening the souls of the disciples and exhorting them to continue in the faith, saying, we must through many tribulations enter the kingdom of God. Continuing in the faith. A real faith, folks, means that you're going to have to suffer. You're going to have to, to go through some things. It's all a part of it. James in James chapter 1 and verse 2 says, My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. Paul tells us that all that live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. The book of 1 Peter, as we studied this morning in our auditorium class, is filled with the concept that suffering is part of faith in Christ. Faith that is unfeigned isn't a faith that says, oh, I, 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 I need to avoid that, I can't do that because that might hurt, or this is going to be difficult and so I'm, not, I'm, I'm sh shunning my responsibility. Faith that is unfeigned is willing to endure that. Faith that is unfeigned makes an impression on others because, as we said earlier, it is lived and it is spoken. Other people will talk about your faith as they talked about the Romans' faith, Romans chapter 8 and verse 1, Paul says, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for you all that your faith is spoken of throughout the whole world. Think about that. People whose faith is spoken of all over the world. That's real faith. People don't talk about fake faith all over the world. The faith that is real, that makes an impression. People talk about that. And it will be an encouragement to others who have the same faith. In Romans chapter 1 and verse 12, I may be encouraged together with you by the mutual faith, both of you and me. Ephesians 1 and verse 15, Therefore I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and the love for all the saints, do not cease to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers. Faith makes an impression on others if it's real, and it will change the world. Paul commended the Thessalonians in 1 Thessalonians 1 and verse 8 that from you have sounded forth the word of the Lord not only in Macedonia and Achaia but in every place your faith toward God has gone out so that we do not need to say anything. Faith that is unfeigned is faith that fights the good fight and overcomes the world. And this is our last point but please hang with me for just a couple of more minutes as we examine this very important reality. Is your faith real this morning? Is it real? Is it genuine? Is it sincere? Is it unfeigned? 1 John 5 and verse 4, the apostle wrote, whatever is born of God overcomes the world, and this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. There are two things I want to tell you about this. First of all, that the life of faith is a battle. Victory comes in battle. And the life of faith 
is a battle. Paul says to Timothy in 1 Timothy 6 and verse 12, fight that good fight of faith. Lay hold of eternal life. There are two kinds of people in any battle, in any contest. Two outcomes. There are the victorious and the defeated. There are the winners and the losers, the conquerors and the conquered. Those who are born again, who have real faith in Jesus Christ, are the ones who overcome the world. Those who are not born again and who do not have real faith in Jesus Christ have no power to win that victory. The second thing I want you to know then is, first, that faith is a battle. Secondly, in the world without God, what you have is materialism, individualism, pleasure-seeking, greediness, covetousness, and lust. All that is in the world, John says in 1 John chapter 2, verses 15 through 17, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world, and the world passes away, and the lust thereof, he who does the will of God abides forever. You see, that world that John describes there is ruled by Satan, and the people who love the world cannot overcome it because they're continually beaten by their sinful desires. Everything that is in that world, that physical, materialistic world, is temporary. It will pass away, John says. It all passes away. It's all lost. And if that's what you're hanging on to, you'll be lost too. In Ecclesiastes 2 and verse 17, the wise man Solomon looked at life without God, life under the sun, all that could be accomplished and achieved and enjoyed. And he says, I hated life because the work that was done under the sun was distressing to me for all is vanity and grasping for the wind. I hated all my labor in which I had toiled under the sun because I must leave it to the man who will come after me. If you don't have God, you lose. If you don't have faith, you lose. Faith is the victory. Money, fame, power, pleasure cannot save you. But your faith can. Faith that is faked will never bring you close to God. Don't fake it. Don't fake it. Is your faith real to you this morning? Let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith. Is your faith real? Maybe it is real, but maybe you've never named the name of Jesus and been baptized for the remission of your sins. That's what the Word of God says you need to do. Maybe you've realized as we've talked this morning that your faith is not real, that you've been pretending. You can change that. Believe and obey while together we stand and as we sing.